Welcome to Chapter 10, Traps and Interceptors of the Uniform Plumbing Code, 2018 edition. We, re we previously went over Chapters uh, 8 and 9, which was indirect waste and vent piping. This is going to be the last chapter in that section for your tests, uh, your upcoming test. So let's go ahead and get right down to it and get into it. So where they are required. Each plumbing fixture shall be separately trapped by an approved type of liquid seal trap. This section shall not apply to fixtures with integral traps. Uh, not more than one trap shall be permitted on a trap arm. Food waste disposers installed with a set of restaurant, commercial, or industrial sinks shall be connected to a separate trap. Each domestic clothes washer and each laundry tub shall be connected to a separate and independent trap except that a trap serving a laundry tub shall also be permitted to receive the waste from a clothes washer set adjacent to it. In other words, you have a laundry sink or a deep sink right there, right? Laundry tub. And you run your clothes washer discharge hose into the tub, then it can utilize that trap. However, if you have a standpipe receptor in the wall, you can't run that into the, um, the trap arm of the laundry tub. It has to be separate. The vertical distance between a fixture outlet and the trap weir shall be as short as practicable, but in no case shall the tailpiece from a fixture exceed 24 inches in length. One trap shall be permitted to serve a set of not more than three single compartment sinks or laundry tubs of the same depth or three labs immediately adjacent to each other and in the same room where the waste outlets are not more than 30 inches apart. And the trap is also centrally located where three compartments are installed. Um, that one, let's see here. I am, I am quickly running out of sketch pad. So you can have three labs, right? A little faucet. Little faucets, you know, right? So you can have three of these guys, and you can have this being the central trap, and this can be tying into that, like so. Okay? That's what they were talking about with that one statement. And they are not more than 30 inches apart. Traps protected by vent pipes. Each plumbing fixture trap, except as otherwise provided in this code, shall be protected against siphonage, back pressure, and air circulation, shall be assured throughout the drainage system using a vent pipe installed in accordance with the requirements of the code. So the reason for the venting is to protect the trap from siphoning out, and that's what they're telling you. You have to have a vent for every trap. Each fixture trap shall have a protecting vent so located that the developed length of the trap arm from the trap weir to the inner edge of the vent shall be within distance given in table 1002.2, .2, but in no case less than twice the diameter of the trap arm. So if I have a two inch diameter trap, the smallest trap length that I can have, trap arm length that I can have is four inches, twice the diameter, okay? That's, that's what they're talking about. And let's take a look at table 1002 for a second. Inch and a half trap arm. Distance trapped to the vent, minimum, for inch and a half. See, for inch and a half, it's twice that, right? So twice that is three. There's your inch and a half, twice that is three, correct? But the total maximum distance is 42 inches. And 42 inches is three and a half feet, correct? 36 plus six is 42, so that's three and a half feet approximately how many inches of fall is that if it's a quarter of an inch per foot? Anyone want to venture to guess that it's um, just over three quarters of an inch? Correct? Because four feet equals one inch of fall. So if I have an inch and a half diameter, it's only allowing me to go half that distance half of that diameter, okay? 
So um, if you go and exceed that length and you exceed the inch and a half or total diameter of the pipe, um, you're dropping below the weir of the trap. And uh, that's not a good thing. So change of direction. A trap arm shall be permitted to change direction without the use of a clean out where such change of direction does not exceed 90 degrees. Horizontal changes in the direction of a trap arm shall be in accordance with section 706.3. For trap arms, three inches in diameter and larger. Now this is the exception. For a trap arm three inches in diameter and larger, the change of direction shall not exceed 135 degrees. without the use of a clean out. Then you have section 1002.4, vent pipe opening. The vent pipe opening from a soil or waste pipe, except for a water closet and similar fixtures, shall not be below the weir of the trap. So let's pull this. This should look relatively familiar to you. Um, so here we have piece coming down this is your trap seal right here this we'll talk about this in a few minutes so this comes through goes up goes up the u-bend comes across the trap arm this is the weir the weir of the trap shall always be this has to be below this vent opening here when this vent opening drops below the weir you're in trouble can't do that okay that's why I put that in there to illustrate that the vent opening has to be above the weir of the trap because that gives you that free flow of air while the waste is down here preventing it from siphoning so your vent pipe opening from the soil shall not be below the weir of the trap General requirements for traps. Each trap, except for traps within an interceptor or similar device, shall be self-cleaning. Traps for bathtubs, showers, labs, sinks, laundry tubs, floor drains, urinals, drinking fountains, dental units, and similar fixtures shall be of standard design, weight, and shall be of ABS, cast brass, cast iron, lead, polypropylene, PVC, or other approved material. An exposed and readily accessible drawn copper alloy tubing trap not less than 17 BNS gauge, shall be permitted to be used on fixtures discharging domestic sewage. Exception, drawn copper alloy tubing traps shall not be used for urinals. Each trap shall have the manufacturer's name stamped legibly in the metal of the trap, and each tubing trap shall have the gauge of the tubing in addition to the manufacturer's name. A trap shall have a smooth and uniform interior waterway. Slip joint fittings. A maximum of one approved slip joint fitting shall be permitted to be used on the outlet side of a trap and no tubing trap shall be installed without a listed tubing trap adapter. Listed plastic trap adapters shall be permitted to be used to connect listed metal tubing traps. So a slip joint. This right here, this assembly is the perfect example of a slip joint. The tubing comes through fits inside this cup and then this nut has a little rubber ferrule or a plastic ferrule in there and as it tightens up it cinches it down. This is a slip joint. A slip joint fitting would be like a 90 or a 45 degree angle so that is chrome tubing to match the trap. This is a trap adapter. Okay. I'm just going to tell you that um, this code section is um, has been reworded because I got shot down one time and every time you get shot down by an inspector you you have a tendency to remember those and or at least I do and I argued with the inspector about this because I said look man I'm allowed a slip joint fitting but what what wasn't said and what was added later is this part right here the trap adapter a son of a bitch he called the trap adapter the slip joint I was so pissed anyways moving on I don't want to dwell on it because you know it's not good to dwell on the negative it's very negative and you shouldn't do it 
size. The size and the nominal diameter of a trap for a given fixture shall be sufficient to drain the fixture rapidly, but in no case less than nor more than one pipe size larger than given in Table 702.1. The trap shall be the same size as the trap arm to which it is connected. So you cannot be more than one pipe size larger than what was given in Table 702.1. And if you remember table 702.1, I think it's on this part. Let's find out. If you remember table 702.1 had a listing of all the, uh, the fixtures and the fixture unit counts and everything. And then this column right here tells you the trap sizes, right? So if it says an inch and a half trap, or, or here we'll do two inch. So this says two inch trap. I can go with a three inch trap, okay? No more than one pipe size larger. The trap shall be the same size as the trap arm to which it is connected. So, if I do have a trap that is two inch, I can't run a three inch trap arm. I have to run the two inch trap arm. I can't increase that size. And that has everything to do with the wear of the trap and the vent opening and proper flow. Traps that are prohibited. No form of trap that depends for its seal upon the action of a movable part shall be used. No trap that has concealed interior partitions except those of plastic, glass, or similar corrosion resisting materials shall be used. S traps, bell traps, crown vented traps shall be prohibited. No fixture shall be double trapped. Drum and bottle traps shall be installed for special conditions only. Uh, no trap shall be installed without a vent, except as otherwise provided in this code. Bladders, check valves, or other type of devices with movable parts shall be prohibited to, be ser to serve as a trap. Now we go to... Trap seals. Each fixture trap shall have a liquid seal of not less than two inches and not more than four inches, except where a deeper seal is found necessary by the authority. Traps shall be set true with respect to their liquid seal. Goodness, excuse me. Traps shall be set true with respect to their liquid seals and where necessary, they shall be protected from freezing. Floor drain traps. Floor drains shall connect into a trap so constructed that it can be readily cleaned and of a size to serve efficiently the purpose for which it is intended. The drain inlet shall be so located that it is in full view, where subject to the reverse flow of sewage or liquid waste, such drains shall be equipped with an approved backwater valve. Trap seal protection. Floor drain or similar traps directly connected to the drainage system and subject to infrequent use shall be protected with a trap seal primer except where not deemed necessary for safety or sanitation by the authority having jurisdiction. Trap seal primers shall be accessible for maintenance. It's very important that these trap primers are maintenance. Um, yeah, if a trap primer ever goes kaput, Chances are it'll go kaput or, you know, lose, uh, it'll, it'll end up opening and then spraying water all over the place. And then you can actually flood out a floor and not even realize that it's going on. Potable water supply trap seal primer valve shall comply with the following standard. Drainage and electronic design type trap seal primer devices shall comply with the other standard. Building traps. This is something that we don't really adhere to here in, uh, in San Diego. However, it is nice to know that it's in the code book. And if ever we need to go somewhere other than San Diego, we will probably adhere to this in at least some case. Building traps shall not be installed except where required by the authority. Each building trap where installed shall be provided with a clean out and with a relieving vent or fresh air intake on the inlet side of the trap which needs to not be larger than one half the diameter of the drain to which it connects. 
Such relieving vent or fresh air intake shall be carried above grade and terminate in a screened outlet located outside the building. Okay, now we're getting into interceptors. <clears throat> interceptors or clarifiers, including grease, oil, sand, solid interceptors, etc., shall be required by the authority having jurisdiction where they are necessary for the proper handling of liquid wastes containing grease, flammable waste, sand, solids, acids, or alkaline substances, or other ingredients harmful to the building drainage system the public or private sewer, or to public or private sewage disposal. The concept of the interceptor is to collect the detrimental material, keep it contained in that interceptor because it intercepts it, and you go in to maintain that interceptor or clean out that debris so that it doesn't get into the sewer system and create a problem. Approval of your interceptor. The size, type, and location of each interceptor or separator shall be approved by the authority of jurisdiction. Except where otherwise specifically permitted, no wastes other than those requiring treatment or separation shall be discharged into an, an interceptor. The design. Interceptors for sand and similar heavy solids shall be so designed and located as to be readily accessible for cleaning and shall have a water seal of not less than six inches. Interceptors shall be so designed that they will not become airbound where closed covers are used. Each interceptor shall be properly vented. Makes sense, right? Because if there's no if there's nothing in it and it's a solid contained box, essentially, you're probably not going to get any ways to coming out of that. Each interceptor or clarifier cover shall be readily accessible for servicing and, ma and maintaining the interceptor in working and operating condition. The use of ladders or the removal of bulky equipment to service interceptors shall constitute a violation of accessibility. The location of an interceptor shall be shown on the approved building plan. Interceptors shall be maintained in efficient operating condition by periodic removal of accumulated grease, scum, oil, or other floating substances and solids deposited in, deposited in the interceptor. The waste pipe from oil and sand interceptors shall discharge as approved by the authority having jurisdiction. Slaughterhouses, packing establishments, etc. A fish, fowl, and animal slaughterhouse or establishment, a fish, fowl, and meat packing or curing establishment, a soap factory, tallow rendering, fat rendering, and hide curing establishment shall be connected to and shall drain or discharge into an approved grease interceptor. First of all, I wait until I get to this section to talk about this. One of the worst smells that we deal with in our industry does not come from general, regular sanitary sewer. It comes from this stuff. The grease interceptor it is just, it, it is a smell that is indescribable. So, can you imagine having to open the lid on one of those things and pulling all that gnarliness out of there? It, uh, it's, it's, Horrible. Minimum requirements for auto wash racks. Oh, I almost forgot. Um, the 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 smell. The first boss I ever had, he was telling me how nasty grease interceptors were, because I was brand new to the trades, you know. And he said that he had to go through a parking structure to clean out a grease interceptor that was actually clogged. And he was walking with the owner, but the owner never told him that he pulled the lid off of the grease interceptor and it was overflowing. So he couldn't really tell where it was. He walked over and, and the owner was about ready to tell him that it should be right about where he's going to walk. And he stepped in and he fell into this thing and he went down about his waist in nothing but grease waste from uh, uh, Indian cuisine. 
So it was, you know, the curry, curry and everything. He said it took him about two weeks to get that smell off of him. It was that bad. So I'll never forget that story because I cannot imagine falling into something like that. Minimum requirements for auto wash racks. A public or a private or public wash rack or floor or slab used for cleaning machinery or machine parts shall be adequately protected against storm or surface, uh, surface water and shall drain or discharge into an approved interceptor or clarifier. So, you know, you, you, you have like your little carts and you want to wash them off. Well, you can build one outside, but you have to put a cover over it and that has to go out to an interceptor. Uh, commercial and industrial laundries. Laundry equipment in commercial and industrial buildings that do not have integral strainers shall discharge into an interceptor having a wire basket or similar device that is removable for cleaning and that will prevent the passage into the drainage system of a solid half inch or larger in maximum dimension, such as string, rags, buttons, or other solid materials detrimental to the public sewage system. Bottling establishments. Bottling plants shall discharge their processed waste into an interceptor that will provide for the separation of broken glass or other solids before discharging liquid waste into the drainage system. That's another one that smelled really bad. The Coca-Cola plant that used to be right off the 94 here. Uh, I, did a, I did a project there and oh man, that place, it, it smelled like somebody spilled you know, about 100 cases of Coca-Cola in the middle of the summer and they just let it rot. It's what it smelled like inside there. Grease interceptors. Where it is determined by the authority having jurisdiction that waste pretreatment is required, an approved type of grease interceptor complying with all of those standards and sized in accordance with section 1014.2.1 or 1014.36 shall be installed in accordance with the manufacturer installation instructions to receive the draining from fixtures or equipment that produce grease-laden waste located in areas of establishments where food is prepared or other establishments where grease is introduced into the drainage or sewage system in quantities that can affect line stoppage or hinder sewage treatment or public or I'm sorry or private sewage disposal systems. A combination of hydromechanical gravity grease interceptors and engineered systems shall be allowed to meet this code and other applicable requirements of the authority having jurisdiction shall wear space or existing physical condition constraints of existing buildings and necessitate such installations. A grease interceptor shall not be required for individual dwellings uh, or private living quarters. Water closets, urinals, and other plumbing fixtures conveying human waste shall not drain into or or through the grease interceptor. So essentially any restaurant has to have a grease interceptor because they're creating grease, right, in their food. So what we're going to be talking about here pretty soon is, is the method of installation and how large the sizing parameters of sizing these, uh, these grease interceptors. And a grease trap and a grease interceptor are pretty much the same thing, okay? Trapped and vented. Each fixture discharging into a grease interceptor shall be individually trapped and vented in an approved manner. So even though you're going into an interceptor, you have to treat it like it's a regular waste line, okay? The key thing here is on these grease and these this grease waste, because now it's going to be called grease waste. It's not sanitary waste anymore. This is grease waste. If it cools off, that grease on the inside solidifies. And as it solidifies, it starts to choke down the piping, and pretty soon you have a clog of solid grease, and nothing's going to flow. That is why they make sure that these interceptors get put in, because they don't want that to occur in the sewage system, which it would. Grease interceptors shall be maintained in efficient operating condition by periodic removal of the accumulated grease and latent material. No such collected grease shall be introduced into drainage piping or a public or private sewer where the authority having jurisdiction determines that a grease interceptor is not being properly cleaned or maintained the authority shall have the authority to mandate the installation of additional equipment or devices and to mandate a maintenance program food waste disposers and dishwashers 
No food waste disposer or dishwasher shall be connected to or discharged into a grease interceptor. Commercial food waste disposers shall be permitted to discharge directly into the building's drainage system. With the exception, a food waste disposer shall be permitted to discharge to grease interceptors that are designed to receive the discharge of food waste. But the grease interceptor has to be designed for that. Because the grease interceptor in of itself, the grease floats to the top and the liquids flow through and there's a series of baffles inside it um, oversimplifying well it's oversimplification here and this is definitely an oversimpli oversimplification of what a grease interceptor will do so your waistline comes in and here's this box right so you have this box and the, and the waste comes out here you have these baffles that are coming down with an opening at the bottom okay and the same thing here and what will end up happening is this stuff, the, the grease floats to the top and the regular waste goes through and solids and whatnot will collect. And then as the regular goes in, it comes out. Okay. So the grease collects at the top and depending on what type of interceptor you have, it, it, you can also have penetration that's like that high off. So any solids will collect down at the bottom and then this stuff just goes right through and all greases float to the top. Okay. And like I said, it's a series of baffles and the waste by the time it gets here, it's just regular wastewater and all the grease collects here. And then you pop the lid. So then you can pop this lid and suck out all this nastiness. And again, that's an oversimplification, but hopefully you get the idea of what these things do. And yes, we install these. Hydromechanical grease interceptor. Plumbing fixtures or equipment connected to a type A and B hydromechanical grease interceptor shall discharge through an approved type of vented flow control installed in a readily accessible and visible location. Flow control devices shall be designed and installed so that the total flow through such device or devices shall at no time be greater than the rated flow of the connected grease interceptor. So now we have this thing over here that ties into the waste. So this is my waste coming into this uh, hydromechanical grease interceptor. And it's a specific type of deal okay it's a specific fitting that goes into the piping this fitting on the inside has a a solid it's it's like cut in half right and this has a hole in it so it's restricting your flow it's one of the only instances where they actually mandate that you have to restrict your waste flow. The grease waste is coming through here and it's slowing itself down using this as it flows through. And the reason why they want to do that is to give it a chance to have this as it's coming through. If you did full flow, you probably wouldn't get separation of the grease and the wastewater. So this slows it down to give the grease a chance to float to the top. And that's the hydromechanical grease interceptor. And like I said, it's one of the only times they actually minimize that. Plus you have to put a vent in there so that it, 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 doesn't, um, it doesn't have that straw, that thumb on the straw deal. And we'll talk about that here in a second. The flow control device shall be designed and installed so that the total flow through the device shall at no time be greater than the rated flow of the connected grease interceptor. No flow control device having an adjustable or removable part shall be approved. The vented flow control device shall be located such that no system vent shall be between the flow control and the grease interceptor inlet. The vent or air inlet of the flow control device shall connect with the sanitary drainage vent system as elsewhere required by this code. 
or shall terminate through the roof of the building and shall not terminate to the free atmosphere inside the building. So like I said, they have like this three quarter deal tied into it, okay? All right, the vented flow control device. It's located between the flow control and the grease interceptor. Um, the air, the vent or air inlet of the flow control device shall connect with the sanitary drainage vent system. So you take this vented deal, okay? Here, real quick. So you have a vent. It's usually a three-quarter line. And you take this and you tie that into... Um, into the regular venting system. And again, that's there just to ensure that that continues to flow and doesn't build up a positive pressure on the bottom. Um, exception, listed grease interceptors with integral flow control or restricting devices shall be installed in an accessible location in accordance with the manufacturer's installation instructions. The total capacity in gallons of fixtures discharging into a hydromechanical grease interceptor shall not exceed two and a half times the certified gallons per minute flow rate of the interceptor in accordance with Table 101421. So your total capacity in gallons shall not exceed two and a half times the certified GPM. So if I have a gallon per minute rating of we'll say 60, because it's easy to do the math with 60, my maximum size hydromechanical grease interceptor, if it's at 60 GPM or gallons per minute, I go two and a half times that. So that's two, two and a half times 60 is what? 140? Yes, no, 150? 150. So the size and the capacity is 150 gallons for a three inch diameter, 60 gallon per minute uh, gravity grease interceptor or maxed out at that, at that capacity. Uh, let's see. For this section, the term fixture shall mean and include each plumbing fixture, appliance, apparatus. Um, so in other words, you, you calculate the size based on your fixtures, right? And then venting. A vent shall be installed downstream of the grease interceptor in accordance with the requirements of the code. We're going to do an example of a hydromechanical grease interceptor right here using fixture capacity. Determine the flow rate from, from each fixture. Calculate total load from fixtures that discharge into the interceptor. So we have a 24 by 24 by 12 inch uh, two compartment, right? Two compartment, 44.9 gallons, okay? And you have the hydrant three, rated appliance two, total 49.9 gallons. Size of your grease interceptor is going to be 50 with a two minute drainage period, 25 gallon per minute. Because 25 gallons per minute is right there with that. So that's, uh, that's your load, your total load from your fixtures that discharge into the interceptor, okay? So there's my load rating. Then you have the gravity grease interceptor. Required gravity grease interceptors shall comply with the provisions of section 10.14.3.1 through 3.7. So this, this is what a gravity grease interceptor and not a hydromostatic, hydromostatic, hydrostatic it's different, okay? These are bigger. The hydromechanical, these guys, 
these guys down here, those, the hydromechanicals, those are the ones that you'll see um, sometimes above ground, the little guys, you know. That's the hydromechanical grease centers up there. These, however, these are much bigger. These are the guys that are underground. These are the ones with the manholes. These are the huge, huge deals, okay? Required gravity grease interceptors shall comply with the provisions. The provisions of this section shall apply to the design, construction, installation, and testing of a, of a commercial kitchen gravity grease interceptor. Waste discharge in establishments from fixtures and equipment which contain grease, including but not limited to scullery sinks, pots and pan sinks, dishwashers, soup kettles, floor drains located in an area where grease containing materials exists, shall be permitted to be drained into the sanitary waste through the interceptor where approved by the authority having jurisdiction. Toilets and urinals can't dump it in there. Waste pipe, enter, uh, waste shall enter the interceptor through the inlet pipe. Makes sense, right? Gravity interceptors shall be constructed in accordance with the applicable standards in table 1701.1 .1, or the design approved by the authority. Each grease interceptor shall be so installed and connected that it shall be easily accessible for inspection, cleaning, and removal of the intercepted grease. A gravity grease interceptor sh that complies with that standard shall not be installed in a building where food is handled. Location of the grease interceptor shall meet the approval of the authority of jurisdiction. So you can't have it installed in the building, but it can be right outside the building. They shall be placed as close as practical to the fixtures that they serve, but in no case inside the building. Uh, each business establishment for which a gravity interceptor is required shall have an interceptor which shall serve that establishment unless otherwise approved by the authority. Each gravity grease interceptor shall be located to be readily accessible to the equipment required for maintenance. Construction requirements. They need to be designed to remove grease from effluent and shall be sized in accordance with the section. Gravity grease interceptors shall also be designed to retain grease until accumulations can be removed by pumping the interceptor. It is recommended that a sample box is located at the outlet end of the gravity uh, grease interceptor so that the authority having jurisdiction can periodically sample the effluent quality. And by what they mean by effluent is the actual discharge um, coming on the outside of it. So a sample, um, a sample box is pretty much like you have your waste coming through. It's almost like another interceptor. So you have your waste, and this guy's, you know, it's got a little manhole deal. And it's just a box like this, right? And the waste comes out at a different elevation here. But they have this solid, I, best way to put it, I guess, would be like it's a slide, okay? It's like a waste slide. So the entire cylinder, this thing is around the whole cylinder. So when the waste does come out, when the, when the waste comes through, and this is after the interceptor, right? So this is where the guy would come in, pop the lid, and just check and watch as this stuff flows through, okay? And it's, a, it's essentially a, a large sight tube because as this discharges out, it spreads out across the whole, the whole cylinder, and you can see, okay, yes, it's regular waste water. There's no grease in it, or hey, there's grease accumulation, you know, clean your interceptor more. That's pretty much what it's for. Uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, sample box, sizing criteria. The volume of the interceptor shall be determined by using table 101436. Where drainage fixture units are not known, the interceptor shall be sized based on maximum drainage fixture unit allowed for the pipe size connected to the inlet of the interceptor. So this tells me that I have my drainage fixture units of 8, 21, 35. So it's, it's sizing, just like you would a regular deal, right? 
up to 35 drainage fixture units is a 1,000 gallon interceptor volume, okay? And then if you look at your notes, it says a size, and again, we're looking at 35 drainage fixture units for a 1,000 gallon volume interceptor. Note two, because note two is right there at interceptor volume. This size is based on drainage fixture units, the pipe size from this code, table 703.2. Useful tables for flow and half full pipes. Um, and then it tells you about the, the book that they reference. And then based on a 30 minute retention time. Okay, again, goes into talking about where they have this engineered method and, and where did they come up with this 1000 um, gallon volume. And it's based on 30 minute re retention time from this list of engineers here. Okay, and their studies, and it's always rounded up to nominal interceptor volume. Where the flow rate of a directly connected fixture has no assigned drainage fixture unit value, the additional grease interceptor volume shall be based on the known flow rate multiplied by 30 minutes. So there's your interceptor volume. Okay. An example of your gravity grease interceptor sizing. Given we have a restaurant with the following fixtures and equipment. One food prep sink, three floor drains, one in the food prep area, one in the grill area, and one receiving the indirect waste from the ice machine in a mop sink. The kitchen drain line, uh, drainage fixture unit count. You have three floor drains at two drainage fixture units each, six drainage fixture units. Mop sink at three drainage fixture units each, three drainage fixture units. Food prep sink three fixture units. So I have a total of 12 drainage fixture units. Using table 10, 14, 3, 6, the grease interceptor will be sized at 750 gallons. 21 fixture units, 750 gallons. We had 12, but 12 is more than eight. Therefore, we have to go to the next one up, which is 750. Believe it or not, 750 gallon um, grease interceptor size based on 30 minute retention is one of the more common grease interceptors that's out there. The abandoned grease interceptor, we have to treat just like we would an abandoned uh, septic system from chapter seven, okay? Then we're gonna get into fog, fats, oils, and grease disposal systems. The purpose of this section is to provide the necessary criteria for the sizing, application, and installation of a fog disposal system designated as a pretreatment or discharge water quality compliance strategy. A fog disposal system, including its components, materials, and equipment, shall, necessar shall, shall comply with the following standards. Sizing and installation. The fog disposal system shall be sized and installed in accordance with the manufacturer's installation instructions. Fog disposal systems shall produce an effluent quality not to exceed 5.84 grains per gallon. Sand interceptors. Where the discharge of a fixture or drain contains solids or semi-solids heavier than water that would be harmful to a drainage system or cause a stoppage within the system, the discharge shall be through a sand interceptor. Multiple floor drains shall be permitted to discharge into one sand interceptor. A sand interceptor is required where the authority deems it advisable to, to have a sand interceptor to protect the drainage system. Sand interceptors actually need to get cleaned out quite often um, because the sand will prevent anything from draining through. So it's almost like you're purposely clogging a line unless you keep it properly maintained. A sand interceptor shall be built of brick or concrete, prefabricated coated steel, or other watertight material. The interceptor shall have an interior baffle for full separation of interceptor into two sections. The outlet pipe shall be the same size as the inlet pipe of the sand interceptor, the minimum being three inches. So if I have three inch pipe going in, three inch pipe has to be going out. The baffle shall have two openings of the same diameter as the outlet pipe and at the same invert as the outlet pipe. These openings shall be staggered 
so that there cannot be a straight line flow between the inlet pipe and the pipe and the outlet pipe. The invert of the inlet pipe shall be no lower than the invert of the outlet pipe. So you, you have a constant here of like inlet pipe, outlet pipe, invert pipe, blah, 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 right? So let's see if we can kind of shed a little light on this. A sand interceptor has a baffle to it. So here's this sand interceptor, right? And we have an inlet coming in here. You have a baffle that sits here in the middle, right? And then we have our outlet pipe over here. We have two holes inside this baffle at the same elevation of this. The invert is the same as that. But we stagger these two holes away from here so you're not going straight through. That way, whenever this thing goes in, the waste goes in, the solids collect on the bottom here. Okay? It collects on the bottom and then the regular waste comes through and dumps into this and fills this up and goes out so you have two shots where the solids can collect okay so that's pretty much what's going on there and then the pipe goes out so that's a solids interceptor Uh, let's see, invert of the inlet is no lower than the invert of the outlet. Sand interceptor shall have a minimum dimension of two square feet for the net free opening of the inlet section and a minimum depth under the invert of the outlet pipe of two feet. So it has to have a minimum dimension of two square feet and it has to be at least two feet deep from invert. Uh, for every five gallons per minute of flow or fraction thereof over 20 gallons per minute, the area of the sand interceptor inlet section is to be increased by one square foot. The outlet section shall at all times have a minimum area of 50% of the inlet section. So as your, as your flow increases, you increase the square footage of your sand interceptor. The outlet section shall be covered by a solid removable cover set flush with the finished floor. And the inlet section shall have an open grating set flush with finished floor and suitable for traffic in the area in which it is located. Sand and similar interceptors for every solid shall be so designed and located as to be readily accessible for cleaning and shall have a water seal of not less than six inches and shall be vented. Gotta have that thing vented. Oil and flammable liquids interceptors. Um, this would be in like a garage. Oh. Perfect. Repair garages and gasoline stations with grease racks or grease pits and factories that have oily, flammable, or both types of wastes as a result of manufacturing, storage, maintenance, repair, or testing processes shall be provided with an oil or flammable liquid interceptor that shall be connected to necessary floor drains. The separation or vapor compartment shall be independently vented to the outer air where two or more separation or vapor compartments are used each shall be vented to the outer air or shall be permitted to connect to a header that is installed at a minimum of six inches above the spill line of the lowest floor drain and vented independently to the outer air. The minimum size of a flammable vapor vent shall be not less than two inches and where vented through a sidewall, the vent shall not be less than 10 feet above the adjacent level at any approved at an approved location, excuse me. The interceptor shall be vented on the sewer side and shall not connect to a flammable vapor vent. Oil and flammable interceptors shall be provided with gas tight cleanout covers that shall be readily accessible. So really what we're talking about is a grease interceptor, but the grease, this type of grease interceptor, which handles flammables, this gets vented, it gets vented independently. Okay. And it has to be outside. It has to get vented outside. It has to get vented independent of everything because of the flammability factor. Are they going to go in later and remove the oils and the flammables from the top? Of course they are, you know. But in the interim, they don't want any of the flammables 
the, the flammable vapor is collecting inside this thing, you know, because who knows, it could explode, right? So it gets vented, and they're talking about that. It's, it gets vented separately from the rest of the, the system. Uh, the interceptor shall also be vented on the sewer side. That doesn't get connected to the flammable vapor vent. Oil and flammable interceptors shall be provided with a gas tight clean out because you don't want any of the flammable vapors coming in. The waistline shall be not less than three inches in diameter with a full size clean out to grade. Where an interceptor is provided with an overflow, it shall be provided with an overflow line, not less than two inches in diameter, to an approved waste oil tank having a minimum capacity of 550 gallons. So now if you do have an overflow, they don't want you overflowing that into the sewer system because obviously if it's overflowing, it's going to be taking some of that flammable liquids with it. So that goes into a, a 550 gallon tank. And that also meets the requirements of the authority having jurisdiction. The waste oil from the separator shall flow by gravity or shall be pumped to a higher elevation by an automatic pump. The pump shall be adequately sized and accessible. Waste oil tanks shall have a two inch minimum pump out connection at grade and an inch and a half minimum vent to atmosphere at an approved location not less than 10 feet above grade. So even the waste oil for the overflow, those have to have a pump, which pumps it out of that tank because the tank is just there for overflow, right? It's kind of like a retention until it hits a certain elevation, which is two inch. Uh, design of interceptors. Each manufactured interceptor that is rated shall be stamped or labeled by the manufacturer with an indication of its full discharge rate in gallons per minute. The full discharge rate at, to such an interceptor shall be determined at full flow. Each interceptor shall be rated equal um, to or greater than the incoming flow and shall be provided with an overflow line to an underground tank. And uh, I'm sorry, the design, we're, we're talking the design of the oil and flammable interceptor because we're still in section 1017. Interceptors not rated by the manufacturer shall have a depth of not less than two feet below the invert of the discharge drain. The outlet opening shall have not less than an 18 inch water seal and shall have a minimum capacity as follows. Where not more than three motor vehicles are serviced, stored or both, Interceptors shall have a minimum capacity of six cubic feet. So if I have a garage that is servicing up to three motor vehicles, my interceptor for that garage has to have a capacity of six cubic feet, okay? Which is essentially, you know, it's, it's not that large. Um, and one cubic foot of capacity shall be added for each vehicle up to 10 vehicles. Above 10 vehicles, the authority having jurisdiction shall determine the size of the interceptor required. But let's say I have 10 vehicles. What's the size? I got six cubic feet, right? Each additional vehicle over three, I add one cubic foot. So the fourth one is going to be seven. The fifth one is eight. The sixth one is nine. The seventh one is 10. Eight is 11. Nine is 12. 10 is 13. So 10 vehicles is 13 cubic feet. You see how that works? Uh, okay, so yeah, above 10 vehicles, the authority has to step in and say, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do it this way. Um, where vehicles are serviced and not stored, the interceptor capacity shall be based on a net capacity of one cubic foot for every 100 square feet of surface to be drained into the interceptor with a minimum of six cubic feet. And that's it for chapter 10. We are done with that. And then the next chapter will be one of my favorite chapters is storm drainage. So until then, we will see you later and enjoy the video.